There's been a lot of testimony about the events of that night, uh, some of the things that happened around town. Did you personally witness any of that? Yes. Can you tell us what you personally witnessed? Um, witnessed many cars being burned. Um, I actually, uh, Shelby recorded an interview with uh, some of the individuals in front of, uh, so there was the big car lot that was burned, but then there was the, the lot actually um, where the armed individuals were on the, on the night of the shooting. Um, we, we actually were in front of that business uh, the night before and Shelby recorded an interview where uh, those individuals were, there, there, there were people who, I guess, I guess the owner of the business had asked people to go out and try to put out the fires. So um, she recorded an interview with uh, individuals who were using a power washer and there were other people using like buckets to try to put out fires uh, with the cars. Uh, Mr. McGinnis, we have a map on the wall behind you there. I don't think there's going to be dispute that uh, we've established that on Monday night, the car source location, which is at the northeast corner of 59th and Sheridan Road, the, had a, a large number of cars that were destroyed by fire that night. Um, did you personally witness that? Yes. Now, you said you spoke to the owner of uh, the business. That would be the car source business? I, I didn't speak to the owner. I spoke to individuals who were out there trying to put out fires. And um, I believe in Shelby's interview, they mentioned that uh, the owner had asked them to come out to put out the fires. Now, you also mentioned there was a second location, and that would be this car source, which is sort of uh, kitty corner to the southwest. Um, and. I know you mentioned there were armed individuals there on Tuesday night, right? Yes, and that, that's the same business that, was, that we saw people with power washers at okay. the night before. At this location that I'm highlighting here, which is at the southwest corner of 59th and Sheridan, on Monday night, did you see any armed individuals there? I did not, know. Were there fires at that location on Monday night? Yes. You, okay. And when you say you saw people putting out fires with uh, pressure washers, were they putting out fires only at that location on the southwest corner, or were they also trying to put out the fires on the northeast corner? It was, um, it was only at the, so it was only at that one and not, I didn't see anybody trying to put out fires on the other one across the street. Understood. I think the fires were out of control at that point, so I get that. I'm just, just trying to pin it down. So um, you told us that you witnessed the fires at those two locations on Monday night. Did you witness any other events on Monday night that were noteworthy? Yes, um, I mean, there were just, there were fires everywhere. Um, and Shelby Jorge and I recorded a number of those, uh, including uh, multiple businesses that uh, were also burned. And you uh, recorded that information and then obviously published stories about it on the Daily Caller website, is that fair to say? That's correct, yeah. I want to move to the next night, Tuesday night, August 25th, the night of the shooting. Did you come back uh, to that area uh, to view the events of that night? Um, well, the way that it happened was we went to the courthouse to, to document the, the demonstrations that were happening in front of the courthouse. And then uh, subsequently, the police pushed the uh, protesters, demonstrators, rioters, whatever you want to call them. Um, away from the courthouse, and uh, that's actually when everybody ended up in that area. On Tuesday night, based on what you've just described, do you recall approximately when it was that you first got out and were covering things? We'd been out all day. We were actually, um, during the day, we were interviewing uh, the owners of the businesses that had been damaged the night before, and so, uh, and also many people from the community in Kenosha came out to help clean up. And so we recorded a bunch of interviews with, um, with those folks, as well as uh, getting aerial footage of the damage. And then uh, we went and ate, and then we went back out before sunset as the demonstrators were arriving at the courthouse. When you said you took video or photos or whatever of people trying to clean up and things like that, did any of that include uh, the defendant, Kyle Rittenhouse? No. Okay. Um, when you I know you discussed some of the events that occurred right out in front, of, in front of the courthouse. Do you recall approximately what time that was when you were here at the, out in front of this building covering things? Uh, we first got out there probably about 7 p.m. 
And how long was it before the event occurred that you described as the police pushing people out of, out of the way? That was after dark, and it was probably closer to 8.30 or 9. What did you do then? Um, well, I was typically in these kind of situations, uh, the goal is to show both what law enforcement are dealing with and, and what, the, what the protesters, demonstrators, rioters, whatever you want to call them. Um, you want to show both situations. So you want to, um, I was in the middle of the protesters on one side and the, and the police on the other. And I actually recorded you know, um, a variety of things, including things being thrown, bricks being thrown at law enforcement. Uh, and uh, then I returned to the hotel because there was no cell service uh, to get Wi-Fi to communicate with uh, folks back in Washington, D.C., as well as uh, post the videos to, uh, for our team to then redistribute. What hotel were you staying at? Um, I forget the name of it. It's literally right there. It's, uh, Is it the Stella? Stella, correct. And that's located uh, a little bit off the map here, I think, to the north. Uh, but very close to where all this is happening? Actually, my, my hotel window was on the uh, third or fourth floor, and it was overlooking that car lot right there. That's actually still there, isn't it? Yeah. Is it? Okay. Um, you, after you returned to the hotel, uh, you've described what you did there. Was there a time when you came back out onto the streets after your time at the hotel? Yeah, I actually didn't. Um, I didn't even post anything because when I returned to the hotel and got on the Internet, um, I saw armed individuals in front of the same business that we had recorded people trying to put out fires the night prior. And uh, in my mind, that was a continuation of that story. And so I actually dropped what I was doing. Um, I also had Shelby and Jorge who were out there. And once I saw people who were armed, you know, the, the situation was clearly escalated in my mind in terms of um, the level of, uh, of danger. And, and part of my role was also to, you know, make sure that none of us uh, were harmed. Um, and so I, I went outside, uh, back outside, and actually I couldn't see that business um, from the window, but I could see the car lot across the street from it. Um, and uh, basically I just ran down the stairs and went right, right out there and, and started communicating with Shelby and Jorge uh, to find out where they were. The business where you saw the armed people out on front of, was that the uh, car source location at the southwest corner of 59th and Sheridan? Yes. You mentioned that after seeing them, you felt like the situation was escalating. Why did you feel that way? Um, anytime that there are guns, uh, that elevates the level of danger in my mind. Um, just given that, uh, you know, I've, I've been to, like I said, across the country, many protests um, in places where people have guns and there's a lot of people in a confined space. Um, you know, these, these are the kind of situations where everybody is very passionate about why they're out there. Um, so in my mind that the presence of weapons meant that, you know, um, I should be on the ground and, and Shelby Jorge and I should be as close to each other as possible to ensure that, you know, we're all safe. So did you feel that the presence of guns at that location, did it make you concerned about the safety of your reporters? Yes. So you said you ran down the stairs of the hotel, uh, and you, did you go then after, after you left the hotel, did you go directly to that location, that car source at 59th and Sheridan? Mm -hmm. Is that a yes? Yes, sorry. Okay. Yeah. Now, you've referred to guns. Uh, have, are you familiar with guns yourself? Um, I'd say familiar. One of the guns that we've talked about already in this case is, um, it's technically a Smith & Wesson M&P 15, but uh -huh. it is an AR-15 type rifle. Yep. Are you familiar with that type of rifle? I've, sh I've shot it. Okay. And when you got to that 59th Street car source location, did you see individuals who were armed with that type of rifle? Yes, multiple. Tell us what you did once you left the Stella and went to that location. Uh, I went down and proceeded straight from the hotel to the car source. And basically, as I walked up, I saw, you know, I guess there were about three on the ground. And, and I couldn't quite tell how many people were on the roof, but there were like approximately five or six armed individuals in front of the business. And 
Um, typically in these situations, uh, especially with armed individuals, I'm just trying to look as unassuming as possible. And so I, I put my hands up and I said, hey, um, are any of you guys willing to do an interview about why you're here? Um, yeah. Now you, in one of the, you've given interviews uh, to various media outlets about your experiences that night, correct? Yes. And at one point you described the appearance of these armed individuals at the 59th Street car source as menacing. Do you um, recall that? I don't recall that. What, what interview was that? Sure. I, I mean, I, would, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say that that's, I, I would, yeah, I would say menacing is uh, not a bad word to describe it. I would say actually, um, like I said, it, 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 um, the presence of weapons just in my mind uh, is elevates the level of, of risk. You did an interview uh, shortly after this uh, August 25th incident with someone by the name of Kyle Hooten. Do you know who that yes. is? Yes, yes I do. And in that interview at one point you indicated that the uh, group at, that was armed at 59th Street Car Source appeared menacing. Okay. Would, you, would you agree with that? Um, we can yeah, play, I, play I, it I would, I would agree. Uh, I would say that I mean, I don't know the exact definition of the word menacing. I guess I was using it in a live interview. Um, but I would say that, uh, you know, if it, like a, the level of risk was elevated, okay. is what I would say. One more. the screen a section of the interview that you did with um, Kyle Hooten. Um, do you recognize yourself on the screen? Yeah. And do you remember uh, giving this interview to Mr. Hooten? Um, yes. Okay. Uh, can we play uh, the excerpt from 712 to 747, please? I basically just walked up to them and said, is anybody willing to do an interview? And Kyle was just the most willing. And obviously that's the kind of situation where you have five six guys armed with some heavy weaponry. Uh, most of them looked like they had AR-15 style rifles and a couple of them were standing up on the rooftop in the darkness. So it was a, it was a menacing situation. So my goal was just to get my uh, interview and, and be as non-threatening as possible and get out of there. So when Kyle volunteered himself, I just wanted to you know, go with the path of least resistance. And he actually- Thanks. Okay. Does that uh, help? Refresh your uh, yeah, recollection, yeah. and this was something that you uh, said within a, a week or two after the. I incident. mean, that was I was in Kenosha when I recorded that interview. That's in the basement of the hotel. Oh, okay, good. That Thank was you. like maybe a day or two after. 
Now, when you, I think you said in that interview, when you approached the group, you wanted to interview someone from the group. Is that fair to say? Yes. How many members of that group did you interview? Uh, one. Who is that? Well, I guess um, uh, Mr. Gulch was the other one who walked into the interview um, as I was recording, uh, Mr. Rittenhouse. And then we proceeded up the street after that. So if you would constitute that as part of the interview, then um, two. But uh, uh, Mr. Rittenhouse was the, the only one that I interviewed prior to him arriving. And I think you said Gulch, but actually, for the record, that's Ryan Balch. Balch, sorry. No yes. problem. No problem. Um, did you ask, uh, and for the record here, the person you interviewed, Kyle Rittenhouse, is seated here at the council table with the gray suit and the red shirt. Is that yes, right? Yes, correct. Um, did you ask him how old he was? Um, I believe, as I was taking out my phone, um, generally, uh, the procedure is, are you willing to do an interview? Yes. Okay, I'm going to record it. Yes. And uh, I believe that I said something along the lines of, um, how old are you? And I believe the response is something along the lines of, I'm an adult. Uh, or or I, I actually don't recall, because I was doing two things at once. But I just remember the answer being satisfactory enough um, for me to proceed with the interview. If the defendant had been honest with you and told you that he was 17, would you have recorded an interview with him? I would. In those instances, uh, I can record an interview if somebody's a minor, but I need permission from the parents. Based on what the defendant said to you, whatever the wording was, you had no indication from him that he was 17. Is that fair to say? I, I actually told the police the night of that uh, I believe that he was in his mid-20s, but I, I believe I said exactly that he, he had a baby face. Um, we've got the interview that you recorded. And that is exhibit number uh, 16. Can we play that, please? you doing out here obviously you're armed and uh you're in front of this so, business we saw burning last night so what's up so people are getting injured and our job is to protect this business and part of my job is to also help people if there's somebody hurt i'm running into harm's way that's why i have my rifle because i need to protect myself obviously but i also have my med kit. and uh what about these other folks obviously there's some other people who are armed Their as well job is to protect me gotcha and then uh, what about these guys up on the roof? Their right? job is to provide overwatch to protect me also. Gotcha. They're protecting everybody on the ground, protecting each other. Understood. And, and we're running medical, and we're going in, and we're getting people. And what about, are you, are you from the area? I am from the area. What brought you out here tonight? You just wanted to provide medical attention? Provide medical attention to people that need it. If somebody's injured, like, you get hurt, I'm grabbing you. I got hit with plenty of, I'm getting hit with plenty of pepper balls, but, you know, as long as it's just bruises. Yeah, I got my, I got my mask. I'm good. And have you encountered any issues yet thus far with law enforcement or anything like that? We had a group earlier try to come and set a fire at the church. So we went to the church and we de-escalated the situation, telling them they need to leave or they will be detained if they're or arrested. This church right over here? That church right there. And we stopped the fire out all the way down at the school. Wow. And what do you think it would have been different if the police had to try to stop them from, from setting the fire? I feel like there would be a lot more casualties and a lot more people injured. So I think the police are fine where they're at and they let us run the medical because EMS is not coming in. This is uh -huh. considered a red zone to the EMS fire. They are not coming in. Yeah. So us citizens, we need to help each other. Me and him are out here running and seeing if people need medical attention. But Speaking you got of which, we need to go check to see if somebody got hurt again. All right. Understood. If you want to follow us, you're fine. Yes, sir. Absolutely. You are at this point in the video walking south along Sheridan behind the defendant and Ryan Balch. Is that right? Correct. 
at that moment, given what you've told us about why you were out there and, and the coverage you've done with other events around the country, why did you decide at that moment to follow them? Um, well, during the interview, he mentioned you know what his mission was there, and it seemed to me that they were proceeding to you know try to do what he was talking about, and uh, I wanted to record it. Can we please play exhibit yeah. number 17? So you guys are kind of like medics who are packing. Yeah, right? basically. Well, he's an EMT. And I'm gotcha. Just, I'm just kind of protecting the ass. Oh, so you're a certified EMT? Yeah. Gotcha. And do you work as an EMT normally? I'm a lifeguard normally. I got my ALS on. Gotcha. The um, defendant tells you that he is an EMT, is that right? Um, I, yes. Did he say anything else to you? It's a little hard to hear in the video uh, as to what his qualifications were. I believe he mentioned something about uh, lifeguard certification. In your experience at the various events that you've covered, similar to what was going on in Kenosha, you know, Seattle, Portland, etc., um, have you seen other individuals who proclaim themselves to be medics or EMTs who are armed with AR-15s? Um, I don't recall any um, people who, I, I saw a lot of people who were medics, some of whom were armed, but uh, not with an AR-15 that I recall. When you saw these other medics who were armed, what sort of things had they armed themselves with? Um, I just recall specifically in Seattle um, a medic armed with a handgun. Other than that one medic with a handgun, do you recall seeing any other medics in any of the other events that you covered who armed themselves with a gun? No. Do you recall seeing any others that armed themselves with an AR-15? No. We can continue the video, please. And I'm former Army Infantry, and I got a whole bunch of trauma training. <laughs> well, thank you for your service. We got you. I appreciate the service. Oh, yeah. Do you, uh, we, it appears Mr. Balch reacts to something at this mm -hmm. point in the video. Do you know what that was? Um, that was a, I believe it was a brick that was thrown at, a piece of a brick that was thrown at the uh, armored personnel carrier right there. Did it, like, bounce off towards you guys or something, do you know? Yeah, uh, it bounced off uh, in front of us. Okay. Thank you. Please continue. It's a little spicy, that's all. It was like, oh, shit. That was really annoying. Hey, little salsa. Could you please not? Could you please not? Does anybody need medical? Does anybody need medical? I think someone's got some medical weed, I'll tell you that. Does anybody need medical? Medical! Anybody 
What, yesterday or today? Today? What, what car over in the dealership? Uh, Sorry, I don't know. First of all, Miss McGinnis, the video we just watched was. Oh. <clears throat> Let's take a break at this point. Um, please don't talk about the case. Uh, read, watch, or listen to any account of the trial. Uh, Fifteen minutes.
Are you cold? Would you come down, please? Okay. Oh, are you? Yeah, my wife says that, uh, that I'm too hot. <laughs> no, that, uh, that uh, <laughs> what does that mean? Uh, <laughs> mm -hmm. No, um, it's true. I, I, uh, one of my daughters and, and I uh, really, really turn it up high. And, uh, oh, yeah. And the rest of the family is... Must be the chocolate. I said it must be the chocolate that I. And it's got sea salt in it. It's dark chocolate with sea salt. Mm hmm. And caramel. Oh, and caramel? I think that's what it said. It tastes like it. I thought that was it. Either that or. Yeah. If it's always been titled in his wife's name. The interlock device has been installed on our other car. Okay, uh, let's proceed, Mr. Binger. Thank you. Mr. McGinnis, when we left off, we had finished watching the video that is entitled Richie McGinnis Walking with Kyle. It is the one in which you followed him south along Sheridan. And at some point in the video, uh, the defendant in encounters uh, a group of individuals. Um, the most noteworthy of one is uh, wearing bright yellow pants. Mm -hmm. Do you recall that? I do, yeah. And there's some interaction between the defendant and that individual. And then the defendant walks uh, across Sheridan Road. But you stayed. Yes. Why was that? Well, Kyle had told me, you know, my goal going into these protest zones is to tell the full picture, or our goal. Um, and uh, after interviewing Kyle, he, or Mr. Rittenhouse, uh, it was clear, you know, what he thought his mission was there. Um, but these individuals seemed to f think differently. And so I wanted to hear what their opinion was on the matter, because that would be part of providing the complete picture. And the uh, individual in the yellow pants accused the defendant of pointing the, his AR-15 at that individual. Is that fair to say? Um, I believe he said, yes, yeah, something along the lines of you were waving the gun, you think you're in a movie. When you approached those individuals to speak with them, you took your, uh, was it your phone that you were yes, recording? Yes, yes. You took your phone and you, you stopped recording. You mm -hmm. pointed it to the ground and then after a while it stopped. Yeah. We've established you're a, a, a video uh, director for your website. Mm -hmm. uh, capturing video is one of the things you do. Mm -hmm. Why did you stop recording that interaction? There are four individuals there, and um, you can see in the video one of them had uh, large rocks in his hands. And, um, you know, it's a public street, so generally speaking, um, but, but just from a, the perspective of an ethical perspective as a journalist or somebody providing content, um, you generally want to get the permission of people if you want to conduct a, a proper interview. Um, so it, 
when I walked up to them, uh, one of the individuals who had these bricks in his hands stepped out on me like he was going to you know, smash my head. Uh, so I put my phone down and I told them, um, I'm not going to record. I just want to know why you guys are mad. Did you ever ask any of them for permission to record them? Um, I did. I, so based on this guy's actions, they didn't want to be recorded. Um, so I actually just, I, I wanted, I was more concerned with uh, why they were mad than actually getting it on video, just from the perspective of gathering information. As a, someone who works in journalism and takes video, gathering information without having a record of it doesn't do much good, though, does it? Um, it, it can because uh, it, it does do good because you can, from that information, then, you know, ascertain other individuals to talk to. And also, I think there's, a, there's an aspect of gaining somebody's trust before you conduct an interview. So a lot of times it's helpful to speak with people about why you're there, um, um, why you want to interview them, and then maybe try to restart and say, hey, you know, now that we're uh, on the same level, can I do this interview? So the question I asked you right before that last one was, did you ask any of those individuals for permission to record them? And I don't believe you answered that question, but I'm assuming the answer is no, based on what you've told us. Um, I actually mentioned that I was going to stop my, I, I stopped my phone and I said, listen, guys, I'm not recording this. I just want to know what the deal is. Why are you guys mad? Okay. So um, it was clear to me that there was no permission to be granted because the guy had pricks in his hands and he wanted and again, I don't mean to be overly formal, Mr. McGinnis, but the question is, did you ask them for permission? I did not. Understood. And obviously, they never verbally gave you permission, correct? Um, they didn't, never said anything like, hey, go ahead, you can record us. Nothing like that. No, they did not. You took their reaction to you, this physical movement, as a sign that you shouldn't be recording them. Is that fair to say? That is fair to say, yes. Okay. You mentioned that one of the individuals had some things in his hand. I think at one point, early, uh, at one point you said rocks, and another one I think you said bricks. Well, it was like, um, I don't. I guess bricks wouldn't be the right word either because they're like gray. So I guess generally a brick would be like terric red. Um, there were like uh, pieces of uh, a gray stones that you would use to build a building. How many of these individuals uh, did you speak with that are all in a row there? Do you remember? I talked to all of them. But uh, how many were there total? There were four. Okay. And one you said had a couple of rocks or stone in his hand? Yeah, one had um, like one in each hand, and then another one had um, like a stone in one hand, and then it was like, it was like a, a strap, leather strap, something like that. Um, that was seemed to be, couldn't tell if it was attached because it was in his hand. Um, and uh, I believe, yeah, those are the only guys who had rocks in their hands. There were two of them. Okay. Um, other than what you've just described, did you see any other weapons of any kind on any of those four people? At the time, I did not. But uh, in hindsight, uh, I believe that one of them was armed with a handgun. With a handgun? Yes. Okay. The person who was wearing yellow pants did not have any sort of weapon, correct? No. Okay. no. Um, not so, that I could see. So it, just so we're clear, at that moment, when you were dealing with those four individuals, you perceived two of them to have uh, rocks in their hands. And that was the extent of any sort of weapon that any of them had that you saw at that time. That I saw, yes. But in, in these kind of situations, it's never really clear who's armed and who's not. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I, I was still unsure of uh, my safety in that situation. Were you armed? Can you help us understand what it was about these four individuals who, by the way, all four of them are black, correct? Mm -hmm. Correct. What was it about these four individuals, two of whom had rocks in their hands, that made you concerned about your safety? Um, well, the way that the one stepped out on me, it was like he, he was presenting the rocks as if he was ready to smash my head. Um, and he stepped out in my direction, at which point I kind of took one step back. Um, and in those kind of situations, I'm just trying to keep my distance to ensure that, you know, if he's going to advance closer, that I'm going to take that many steps backwards to keep our distance. Um, yeah. Do you have any idea why this individual 
step forward towards you in such an aggressive manner? It was because of my phone. Um, because he, I, I believe that it was because he perceived me to be recording him um, and he didn't want to be recorded. Once you stopped recording, did his demeanor so change? I put my phone down and then I told him I'm not recording, I just want to know what happened and his demeanor did not change um, and he still had the rocks in his hands uh, as if he was ready to hit me. And so then I said, hey guys, um, let's take a step back here for a second. Does anyone want to, um, I generally carry like cigarettes and white claws to uh, defuse these kind of situations. Um, it's like a tactic, you know, people are always really angry in these, in these areas and, and that's a good way to, I guess, break the ice. So in your experience uh, in these types of crowds, you have experienced anger, threatening behavior, that sort of thing before. Is that fair to say? Yes. Definitely. And one of the ways you've learned to diffuse the situation is to offer individuals something like cigarettes anything, or... Anything, yeah. Just, just any, yeah, cigarette or, or White Claw. That's yeah. generally... White Claw is a hard seltzer, an alcoholic beverage in a yes. can. And I actually offer... I had two in my... Uh, gas mask bag and I just said does anyone want a white claw and it's like you know people generally think it's kind of funny and oftentimes take me up um, and it's a good tactic to kind of you know because the goal here is to elicit uh, the, their their truth what they think is the reality in this situation and um, so my goal is to basically make them feel comfortable telling me what they think the truth is you know um, and that's that's one tactic to achieve that. So when you offer these guys a white claw, did they take you up on it? One of them did, yeah. The guy who was squatting down in the, in the image. So you handed him the white claw? Um, uh, so, yeah, I, I, I said, do any of you want a white claw? I had my hands up, and I, I said, I'm going to reach. And actually, the guy who was squatting down, he started to stand up. He said, I'll take one. And uh, I pulled it out, and I used to bartend, so I cracked it for him and then handed it to him. So you gave them a total of one? One, yes. This individual you described with the rocks who stepped forward to you, can you demonstrate for us uh, the manner in which he was holding those rocks? Because you you made it sound like he was about to hit you with them or something. Yeah, it was, so. I mean, he was like holding it, um, you know, as if like he was ready to fight, but with rocks. So, you know, he was kind of in an athletic position and he stepped out in front of the other guys towards me like that. Um, and how close did he get to you? Um, probably eight feet. Did he I, ever? I took a step back when he took a step forward, and actually, that was part of the reason why they thought my actions were so funny to them was that I was so scared and so ready to run away. You you say they thought your reactions were funny. How do you know they thought that they were funny? Because they all laughed when I asked them if they wanted a white claw, and 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 um, actually, after that, uh, once I gave it to the one individual. They started making fun of the guy with the rocks, saying, oh, you think you're so tough. Like, there's one of him and four of us. And, like, look at how scared he is. They're Sounds like, like at that him. point, the whatever tension was gone. Correct. Okay. Uh, and this individual stepped forward with the rocks. Did he ever throw a rock at you? No, and actually he, he put his hands down at that point um, once his, his friend made fun of him. Okay. You were never harmed in that incident in no. any way? Okay. Nope. All right. So... We've seen the end of that video, uh, which at that point you are talking with those four individuals uh, when you stop recording on your phone. Is that fair to say? I'm sorry, could you repeat the question? Sure. We just watched a video of you following the defendant and Ryan Balch down uh, south on Sheridan. You encounter the individual with the yellow pants and the other three individuals next to him. You walk up to them after the defendant walks away. You start to have a conversation with those individuals, the, mm -hmm. the four of them, and you stop recording. Yes. Okay. What I want to know is after you stop recording, how long did you spend talking to those guys? Mm, it was a matter of minutes. Um, I'd say less than five minutes. Um, that whole interaction that I just described was probably about two minutes, and I talked to them for maybe another minute after that. After that, what happened? Um, I got back to my task at hand, which was um, inquiring about why they were mad at um, uh, who I later found out to be Mr. Rittenhouse. Um, and uh, they said something along the lines of, yeah, we were over there, we were jumping on some cars, and he came up with his gun. And that was actually 
right then was the point that I saw Mr. Rittenhouse running down the street, and I said, hey, guys, I got to go. Are you able to show us on that map, uh, when you saw the defendant running, uh, which you just described, where was that on that map? Are you able to show us that? Um, it was like, let's see, so we were right in this green right here. Uh, we, were, we were approximately right here, at the green in the parking lot, and he was running this way. Okay, you just kind of drew a line all the way from 60th down to 63rd. Are you able yeah. to be a little bit more specific as to where he was um, when, you, when you saw the defendant running? So you're saying where was the defendant? Yes, when you first saw him, you said he, he drew your attention because he was running. Yeah, he was, um, so he was basically uh, right running down this corner right here. So you've indicated an area right in front of the ultimate gas station. Um, it was in front of this, uh, we were over here. Okay. And he was here. All right. So, so again, I don't. The guy, the gas station's up here. He, he, it was down here. Okay. On that map, I think it's labeled the ultimate convenience center, but it's the gas station that is on the southeast oh, gotcha. yeah. corner yes. of 60th. That's correct. And, That's okay. correct. Yes. And so, uh, just because sometimes these things don't translate into the record, uh, you've used the pointer to illuminate uh, an area in front of the First United Methodist Church, on the east side of the church, uh, between the church and Sheridan Road. There's a parking lot area there, and you've kind of pointed to that as where you were talking to these four gentlemen. Is that a fair summary of yes. the location? Um, I believe, actually, it was a little bit further south, so it was like somewhere right around here. Okay. Um, so sorry, it was actually just a bit farther. Is this south or? The, uh, the bottom of the map is south. The bottom of the map is south, so it was a bit farther south than that, yes. Okay. And you saw the defendant running. Uh, was, he, was the defendant in Sheridan Road when you saw him running? Yes. Did you see anything in his hands when he, when he first saw him? Yes. What did you see? He had um, one of those small fire extinguishers that you saw earlier in the video. It was that sized fire extinguisher in uh, one hand and the uh, AR-15 in the other. What did you do next? I told the guys that I had to go and, and I proceeded after um, Mr. Rittenhouse. Why? Because, uh, well, he had a fire extinguisher in his hand, so, you know, I perceived that as he was running to some kind of event uh, that was taking place that would be uh, newsworthy. What did you do after that? Uh, I started jogging after him, and uh, he was uh, quite far in front of me, uh, and I, I called my coworker Shelby to inquire where she was because uh, Seeing the fire, uh, the way you know that he was running, and the fact that he had a fire extinguisher in his hand, I said something along the lines of, uh, uh, "I won't use the expletive language that I was using, but it, something's about to go down. Where are you? Um, we should we should make sure we're next. We're we're close to each other." You said you made a phone call to Shelby. Yes. Where were you physically when you made that phone call? So I was in the process of, I was actually jogging, um, right, like right around here. You are pointing to an area on Sheridan Road, um, just to the north of 61st Street. Yeah. Um, I was probably, I was probably right around this corner by that point that I called her, actually right around here, um, because I had opened my gas mask bag for the White Claw, and then I ran off without clipping it back. Um, my gas mask actually fell out of the bag. So what happened was the, the gas mask fell out, I picked it up, I put it back in the bag, I clipped the bag, and then I pulled my phone out to call Shelby. So it was, it was probably actually just south of there by the time I got on the phone with her. You have uh, given an interview in which you indicated that uh, your attention was drawn, or, or when you saw the defendant running, that you felt that he was drawing the attention of the crowd. Do you recall saying that in one of your interviews? Yeah, I think in that interview, um, I was referring, which interview are you referring to? I think it's the one that you gave uh, to Tucker Carlson, actually. But I'm not, um, I, okay. I, I believe find that it. that I was referring to him shouting medical. Um, and I did notice that uh, when he was running, there were a lot of people looking in that direction. There were like, um, in this area, this parking lot here, there were like dozens, if not hundreds, of protesters or rioters or whatever you want to call them um, right in here. 
And so when he was running, it was like kind of a, you know, people directed their attention that way, for sure. You also said that you felt that um, this was going to be a hairy situation. You also characterized it as a dangerous situation. Do you recall that? Um, yes. Uh, the, the combination of the fire extinguisher and the fact that he was running um, indicated to me that something was about to happen. Um, potentially, you know, if there's a fire involved, um, that's why I wanted to get a hold of Shelby and find out where she was. Did you also feel that the defendant running with an AR-15 through this type of crowd could cause a problem? Um, in my mind, in that moment, I couldn't think of a situation that would necessitate somebody running through a public street um, with one of their hands occupied by a fire extinguisher and the other one occupied by a weapon, um, you know, kind of serving dual roles there that, that didn't, it seemed to me, um, yeah, it's, it's not the way that I was taught to handle a weapon in a public place. Did it seem a contradiction to you to have a weapon in one hand and a fire extinguisher in the other? I wouldn't say contradiction. Um, I would say that, you know, all these, like in these protest zones, there's like, everybody's kind of serving a role. So uh, there were like those punk rockers that we saw, the skateboarder dudes. Um, they were clearly like kind of a fire brigade type because they all had fire extinguishers. Um, and, you know, you have like people who are medics, you have um, uh, all kinds of different roles. So I wouldn't say uh, necessarily contradictory because generally speaking, um, you know, they're, I, I just wouldn't deem that to be a contradiction. The punk rockers, the fire brigade that you described, did you see any of them with guns? I did not, no. Did you feel that uh, carrying around an AR-15 was incompatible with the role of a medic or the fire brigade? Um, I wouldn't use the word incompatible. Um, Certainly doesn't match up, though. Um, I don't know exactly what you're getting at, um, but I wouldn't say, uh, I don't know what matching means here in this instance, if you could clarify that. So you indicated that when you saw the defendant running, you left those four individuals and followed. You've described a uh, point in that uh, process where the gas mask fell to the ground, you picked it up, whatnot. Did there come a time when you were following the defendant when he was no longer running? Um, right about, uh, I, I was on the phone with Shelby at the time, and uh, right about when he slowed down, um, I was still running to catch up. So he did slow and stop. Um, you know, down, down and around where the eventual shooting took place. So he starts running, uh, walks for a bit, and then there's a time after that when he begins to run again. Would you agree with that? Yes. Okay. Where were you in relation to the defendant as you're following him down Sheridan Road? Um, so he was probably just, you know, he was, I mean, at the moment that he slowed down, I was probably like a half a block back. He slowed down probably right around here. And I was like, I could just barely see him. I could just barely see him. Um, and so I was probably right back here when he slowed down right around here. And I was still on the phone at the time. When he slowed, when the defendant slowed down, were you still running? Yes, I was, I was running to catch up with them. When you eventually caught up to him, um, how close were you behind him in the end? Um, so, it's hard to, I guess, from the point where he was slowed down, um, when I caught up, to, caught up to him, it was just a moment after that that he started uh, running again. So, I guess at that time, I was probably like 30 feet back. And you described that the defendant then began running again. Yes. 
was there any event that you perceived, that you heard or saw, that attracted your attention at the same time that the defendant started running? There were a lot of people yelling. Do you know what they were yelling? There were a lot of screams. I heard, like, an N-word. Um, and um, you can hear in the video the, the friendly, friendly. Um, but it was mostly just yelling. I didn't hear really anything decipherable. We've heard some references to that friendly, friendly. Now, I know it's hard, Mr. McGinnis. I'm going to try and ask you to put yourself back in the uh, mindset of that evening. Uh -huh. uh, I, I assume since that evening, Obviously, you said you've given a lot of interviews, correct? So, um, I, don't I, I gave as many interviews as I felt necessary to inform the public of what I saw. And I wasn't trying to make it exaggerate or anything like that. But no, you've, that's fine. You've given some interviews. Um, there have been a lot of videos out there on the internet. I assume you've watched some of those. Is that fair to say? Yes. Okay. If we can try our best to put aside what we've learned since then and mm -hmm. try and go back to that moment and I'd like you to tell the jury what you were thinking and observing in that moment uh, without the benefit of hindsight mm -hmm. or other videos or things like that. Is that, is that yes. fair? Okay. Yes. You mentioned friendly, friendly. Uh, mm -hmm. At that time, that moment, in that evening, mm -hmm. do you recall hearing that? I do not. Um, I recall um, I was on the phone as well. So I was talking to Shelby, and I recall hearing the yelling while I was still on the phone. And I said something along the lines of, oh, expletive, I got to go. And, um, and I hung up on Shelby, at which point that's when the running had started. Like I was already uh, basically running with uh, Mr. Rittenhouse and later Mr. Rosenbaum um, at that, that moment. So let's continue at the, where you just left off. Mm -hmm. Please tell us what, you, what happened next. It was, it was hard for me to see, because like I said, I was like 30 feet back at the time. Um, but I could see a lot of yelling. I could hear a lot of yelling, and I could see there was a crowd of people in the street. And um, one individual, Mr. Rosenbaum, advancing towards Mr. Rittenhouse, as well as a couple of other individuals who were moving very quickly um, in the area. Uh, but it was, it was hard for me to see, because I was a little bit back, and it was, it was dark. What happened then? Um, Mr. Rosenbaum advanced towards Mr. Rittenhouse. Uh, Mr. Rittenhouse gave like a, I think he maybe saw him coming and you know, gave like kind of a, uh, I said on the night of uh, to police that it was like a juke, but it was more like just a, a pivot and a run. Please continue. What, what happened after that, as um, far as you recall? And, and then um, he pivoted. Uh, ran towards this um, parking lot right here. So he was like right on the side of the street and he ran towards this lot and um, Mr. Rosenbaum ran after him and I was behind both of them. So the sequence of the folks that were involved in this running as we've seen in many other videos is Mr. Rittenhouse is uh, in front, Mr. Rosenbaum is running after him, and you are behind Mr. Rosenbaum. Is that fair to say? Uh, yes. How far back from Mr. Rosenbaum were you as the through as as the the pursuit went through the car source parking lot? Um, well, it's hard to say because I kind of caught up to them. Um, I was running a bit faster, and so uh, at the time initially, I was probably 30 feet back when the first when everybody first started running, but then. By the time I arrived in the lot, it was 15 feet. And you continued to be behind Mr. Rosenbaum at the time that the defendant shot and killed him, correct? Um, I did alter my trajectory a little bit um, when I saw Mr. Rittenhouse turn around and saw Mr. Rosenbaum um, lunging for the front portion of the rifle. Okay. Let me stop you there for a second. First of all, we know now that that individual who was shot and killed by the defendant was Joseph Rosenbaum. Mm -hmm. At the moment this was all going on that night, did you have any idea who that person was? No clue. Had you ever heard the name Joseph Rosenbaum before? I'd never even seen that individual. Up until these events, you had not seen that individual at any time? No, I had not. Okay. I saw, I saw videos after the fact of where he was, but I actually wasn't at that location, uh, that gas station at that time. 
And again, I want to hear what you yeah. saw and what you know and not gotcha. other stuff. Um, in the videos of this incident, you appear to be holding up your cell phone. Yes. Is that fair to say? Correct. Um, tell us about that. So I got off the phone with Shelby, and um, I wasn't sure what was going to happen. So I, I attempted to record on my phone, and I thought that I was recording at the time. Uh, it turns out that I actually just took a live photo of the ground. I assume at the time that I pressed uh, what was the you know photo button instead of the record button, the video button. So as you're running, you're holding up the phone, thinking you're recording video, but in fact you're not. Is that fair to say? Yes, the video um, did not start until, and I've turned all of this over, I'm sure you've reviewed it, Sure. but it did not start until just as I was arriving over Mr. Rosenbaum after he had been shot. So I don't know what happened in that period of time. I, I wasn't even looking at my phone. You know, usually when I'm recording, I'm, I'm constantly looking at what the video is recording to make sure that, you know, everything's in the frame and whatever. Um, but at that time, obviously, I was fixated on the situation in front of me rather than my phone, so I didn't realize that it wasn't recording. And I don't know what happened or why it started uh, later. What was it about the situation in front of you? You said you were fixated on it. What, what was it about the situation in front of you that, that focused your attention? Well, there, there were, um, we were running very quickly, number one. So I was just, just by virtue of the fact that I was running, uh, I was focused on that, but also um, I knew having uh, seen Mr. Rittenhouse earlier and just using my eyes at that time that he was armed. Um, and also uh, there was uh, a bag that was thrown by Mr. Rosenbaum. And so clearly there was like, you know, um, something about to happen. So I was paying attention to that. Did you ever see a weapon on Mr. Rosenbaum? I did not. Never saw a gun on Mr. Rosenbaum? I did not. Never saw him have a knife? Nope. Never saw him have a club or a bat or a chain or anything like that? I just saw the, the bag that was thrown, that was it. As the chase is occurring in the car source parking lot, did you hear, and again, I, I want you to go back to that moment. Yes. We've seen other videos, we've heard mm -hmm. other videos, so we have hindsight. But in that moment, mm -hmm. as you are following the chase behind Mr. Rosenbaum, behind Mr. Rittenhouse, did you hear Mr. Rosenbaum say anything? Um, there was a FU, um, and at the, at the time in that instance, you know, my recollection of it the night of, it, it was really hard for me to decipher, you know, whether that was, uh, who, who yelled that, um, after seeing the footage, it's very clear to me who yelled it. Okay. okay. And, Let and me after, stop. Yeah. I don't want to, I want to, mm -hmm. in that moment. Yeah. I'm, I'm interested in your perceptions of the sounds around you. Oh. So I understand there's a lot going on and, and mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's a scene, but put yourself back in that moment. Do you recall hearing Joseph Rosenbaum say anything? No. Do you hear the re recall hearing the defendant I mean, say I, I heard things said, but I don't recall it coming, you know, me perceiving it coming from him because um, like, for example, in that instance, there was a, uh, a pop, and then when Mr. Rittenhouse turned around, my focus was purely on uh, the, the barrel of the weapon and, and where that was going, so I, no, I didn't. Okay. Uh, in fact, when you were talking to the Kenosha Police Department after uh, this incident, and very shortly thereafter, mm -hmm. uh, you were asked if you heard any words exchanged between Mr. Rosenbaum and Mr. Rittenhouse. And you said no. You yeah, I mean, saying that? well, that, that was the phrasing of the of the question, which is, were there words exchanged? And so that would imply, you know, like some kind of conversation. Um, if they had have asked, did you hear uh, Mr. Rosenbaum yell anything? I might have phrased it differently because I just I just didn't focus on that uh, at the time. But the way that you know there was nothing exchanged. That's that's or that I saw. So let's continue. Uh, you just mentioned hearing a pop sound. Was that during this chase? That was uh, right before Mr. Rittenhouse turned around during the chase, yes. Okay, and uh, just to finish that thought up, you're talking about when Mr. Rittenhouse turns around and shoots Joseph Rosenbaum. Correct. 
Just before that, there was a, a pop sound. Correct. Again, we, with the benefit of hindsight. Yes. But let's put that aside. In that moment, as you are running, first of all, did you hear that pop as you I, were running? I did hear the pop, but um, given like the environment, it's not that uncommon to hear those kind of pops. So it, at that time, it was not clear to me that it was from a gun or what it was from. In fact, I, I did tell police that uh, it was my understanding that he turned around because he felt like uh, he was running into a corner because that, that area of the um, parking lot where the shooting actually took place was like there's the wall right here and then there was like cars parked kind of. Um, so it, it, it at night of, it, it appeared to me that he turned around because he uh, had reached a dead end or something like that. Could you please pull up Exhibit 25? Mr. McGinnis, we have, and I think I need to turn on the TVs again. Mr. McGinnis, there is a video on the screen which has already been introduced into evidence, and we've heard some testimony about it. Um, I don't. Have you ever seen this before? Um, I saw sc uh, screenshots of the this thermal footage. Okay. Uh, was that from yesterday or the day before during the trial? Yeah. Okay. Um, the there's been testimony that uh, there is an individual with a circle around them uh, identified as person of interest number one. That is Joseph Rosenbaum. There is a square around a second individual who is identified there as person of interest number two. That is the defendant, Kyle Rittenhouse. Mm -hmm. um, I, you will come into this video, if you're not already on it, uh, behind all of them. So I'll, I'm sure you'll be able to recognize yourself. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to play this forward a little bit so you can okay. see it. Um, I'd like you to pay attention to the movements of, every, of the three of you, Mr. Yep. Rosenbaum, yourself, and the defendant and then I'll ask you a couple questions about it. So okay. if we can play it forward, please. Let's pause it there, please. Um, were you able to see yourself on that video? Yes. Okay. And uh, it shows you, can we back up about 10 seconds, please? Um, go back a little bit further, please. 10, 10 more seconds. Okay, continue there. Go forward, please. Or play it, rather. Thank you. Possible, Mr. McGinnis, are you able to see yourself on that video at that very moment? Um, I think I'm one of the those two people. Okay. Let's con uh, let me continue forward, and uh, unfortunately it's that hard laser to tell. doesn't I work on right, TV. Like, so, oh, gotcha. uh, let's continue forward, uh, and I'll pause in, in just a little bit here. Yeah, now I can see me. All right, yeah. pause. Uh, Mr. McGinnis, I've got a uh, Sister Marciana's uh, pointing device. The judge has uh, allowed us to use. Uh, use this and go to up to that uh, screen in the corner and can you point out yourself on that video? Um, I think it's hard to see right here, but uh, can you just go back for a second? Like, 
Yeah, why don't we rewind? Right on, right on the yeah, we'll go. Let's go back 10 seconds and play from there. And then, Mr. McGinnis, just pause uh, when you see yourself, or raise your hand when you see yourself, and we'll pause it, okay? Okay, uh, can you hold it up there one more second, please? I didn't quite see it. Okay, so just for the record, if you are pointing to an area that is on a screen to the left of a vehicle that has right or wrong been referred to as a Dur Duramax. 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 Is that a thing, a Duramax? It's a vehicle. Is it? Yeah. A Duramax vehicle. I know from other videos that this vehicle is parked in a way that the uh, hood of the vehicle is. Uh, to the lower left, or sorry, lower right of this uh, TV screen facing Sheridan Road. So if, if, if you'll accept that representation, then it, it, you're pointing to an area that is near the right, uh, or the, the rear passenger corner of that Duramax. Would that be fair to say? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's a little bit farther out here, right? Okay. All right, let's continue the video forward, please. where you are okay and you uh, just can you hold it up there for a second longer so we can make sure we all see it okay that is you now I, I can tell from that video that there appears to be uh, part of your body extended forward is that your arm holding the, the cell phone yes okay was that your right arm if you recall um usually it'd be my right arm okay fair enough um thank you no, I'm good. uh you can leave that up there that's fine Thank you. You can go ahead and have a seat, please. Now, this is stopped uh, at a moment which is right around the time, I think we're maybe a, a frame or two before uh, Mr. Rittenhouse uh, fires and uh, the shots at Mr. Rosenbaum. Um, and everyone can see where you're at in relation to that. What I want you would, uh, what I'd like you to do, Mr. Guinness, is tell the jury your, uh, in your own words, uh, what was going on at this particular moment uh, where we stopped the um, video. So basically, I was running behind Mr. Rittenhouse and Mr. Rosenbaum, and um, I, like I mentioned before, uh, Mr. Rittenhouse turned around and Mr. Rosenbaum continued, and uh, I was continu continuing uh, but then I realized, you know, that they were about to basically collide. Um, and so uh, at that moment, um, I was still running, but just before the shots, I, I kind of altered my trajectory of my run a little bit uh, in the direction that I perceived to be uh, out of uh, harm's way. What do you mean harm's way? You, you were several feet away from them. What, what was the harm to you? Well, um, once Mr. Rittenhouse turned around and Mr. Rosenbaum continued, it was a very short, very, very short period of time um, from when he turned around to uh, when um, the, f the shots were fired. And basically in that very short period of time, I realized that Mr. Rosenbaum was continuing to advance and that uh, Mr. Rittenhouse uh, was standing still and that they would be, um, uh, based on, Mr. Rosenbaum's, uh, the way that he was running and, and then eventually lunging towards the front portion of the rifle, um, it was clear to me that something with the weapon was about to happen and I didn't want to be on the wrong side of that. When you say something with the weapon was about to happen, what do you mean? Well, it wasn't clear to me whether the weapon would be grabbed or, or fired or what exactly was going to happen, but it was clear to me that uh, it was a situation where it was it was likely that um, something uh, dangerous was going to happen, what, be it Mr. Rosenbaum grabbing it, uh, Mr. Rittenhouse shooting it. I, I didn't know, but I knew that uh, my eyes at that moment were, like in this exact moment, were fixated on the barrel of the uh, weapon because I didn't want to end up uh, on the receiving end of that. You said your eyes were focused on the barrel of the weapon. Yes. Where was the barrel of the weapon pointed? Um, at at this moment, when he stopped, it was aimed about 45 degrees at the ground. 
did the aim of the barrel of the weapon change? It did. Um, and when Mr. Rosenbaum lunged, uh, Mr. Rittenhouse uh, kind of dodged around. Um, and then uh, that's when it was leveled at Mr. Rosenbaum and fired. What was the position of Mr. Rosenbaum's body when the defendant fired at him? Well, there were four shots, but at the, it was like in one continuous motion, it was like a lunge towards the front portion, a dodge around, and um, when he missed, um, his momentum continued forward. So and I'm it, gonna stop you for one second. Yeah. When he missed, who's he? Mr. Rosenbaum, I'm okay. sorry. Please yes. continue. Um, when Mr. Rosenbaum um, did not make contact with Mr. Rittenhouse, or it wasn't clear to me whether or not they made contact, but what was clear to me was that um, the trajectory of the rifle wasn't really altered by Mr. Rosenbaum's lunge. So if they did make contact, then it was um, just a glance. It wasn't enough to alter um, the trajectory of the rifle. But uh, I, and again, this is just because that was the only thing that I was looking at at that point. Um, and it's not clear to me whether uh, um, he, he basically fell forward. But that I'm was gonna stop, as yeah. I'm gonna stop you for a second because you said he again. Can you? Oh, I'm sorry, uh, Mr. Rosenbaum. Okay. Um, he fell forward. Y yes, like it was. Um, it was as if you know, if you were to lunge at somebody. If anybody were to lunge, they'd probably stop themselves, you know, from falling face down on the ground. But the shots were fired in the exact instance that he was, his momentum was going forward, and that continued until Mr. Rosenbaum uh, landed on the ground. When Mr. Rosenbaum landed on the ground after being shot by the defendant, what was the, Mr. Rosenbaum's body position? Um, he was lying face down. Is it fair to say, if I'm understanding your testimony correctly, that when the defendant shot Mr. Rosenbaum, Mr. Rosenbaum was already falling forward? Uh, his moment, I wouldn't say falling, I would say his momentum was definitely going forward. It's not clear, you know, to me whether he would have, uh, I guess, fallen if, you know, the shots hadn't uh, been fired, but certainly his momentum was, um, was in the forward direction and also uh, his hands were out in front of his feet, uh, such that you know uh, his center of gravity was uh, beyond where his feet were. You gave an interview um, in which you characterized this incident as the defendant shooting Mr. Rosenbaum while Mr. Rosenbaum was falling. Do you recall saying that in an in, in interview? Um, there were four shots. So um, I don't recall specifically saying that, but um, was that the direct quote? Let's put it up on the screen. Okay. I'm told that. Uh, it's here early. So um, I'll give you a few more minutes. Do you want to continue? Could we but just finish this little may, piece up and may, then I'll, I'll break? May. Can we play this uh, starting at the 52 second mark, please? Well, Tucker, I was just about 10 or 12 feet behind them as they ran into the parking lot. And what I saw was Rosenbaum pursuing Rittenhouse. And Rittenhouse turned around. Now, right before he turned around, I'm not sure if this was a reason why he turned around, but there was a gunshot, and that's actually visible on video. It's not clear whether or not that gunshot was fired into the air or towards Rittenhouse, but Rittenhouse did turn around immediately after that. And at that point, he went from running away to aiming his weapon at Rosenbaum, and I was actually directly behind Rosenbaum. So I took one or two steps to my right, right as Rosenbaum was lunging for the barrel of the rifle, and he was that close to him. And Rittenhouse actually took the barrel of the rifle and just dodged around. And at that point, as Rosenbaum was falling forward, he fired quickly four shots into Rosenbaum. And at that point, I was only about. We just played an excerpt from a video uh, interview that you did with Tucker Carlson on Fox News. Do you recall this interview? Yes. And the date of this interview is August 28th, 2020. Yes. Does that sound about right? Mm -hmm. So that's three days after the event occurred. Is that, is that fair I to think, say? Uh, I think it was on a 
So it happened on a Tuesday, and I believe that that was Friday. Sure, three days later. Mm -hmm. um, fair to say that on Friday after this incident, your memory of it might be better than it is 14 months later? Um, it's just the same. I'm never going to forget it. I, generally speaking, people's memory is better when it's closer in time. You'd agree with that? Yeah. And you mentioned seeing some other videos before you gave this interview to Tucker Carlson. So you had watched some things in those three days, correct? That is correct, yes. Okay. But in this video here, uh, you are telling uh, Fox News, Dr. Mm -hmm. Carlson, that the defendant shot Mr. Rosenbaum as Mr. Rosenbaum was falling forward, correct? Um, yeah, it's unclear to me because the shots were so quick uh, uh, whether you know, the shots are the reason why he, uh, because he lunged and then the shot was fired as he was lunging. So it was like, um, I guess, perhaps it was the shots that caused him to then, rather than stopping himself, um, just fall flat. That's not what you just said. Let's play this back about 20 seconds, please. for the barrel of the rifle, and he was that close to him. And Rittenhouse actually took the barrel of the rifle and just dodged around. And at that point, as Rosenbaum was falling forward, he fired quickly four shots into Rosenbaum. And Your interview three days after this incident says that Mr. Rosenbaum was already falling forward when the defendant used the gun and discharged the shots. I, I don't see why that's inconsistent with what I'm saying right now. He was, he was lunging, falling. Um, I would use those as synonymous terms in this situation because basically, you know, he threw his momentum towards the weapon, and when the weapon wasn't there, his momentum was continuing, and that's the point at which he fired. So if you use the word falling or lunging, it was his momentum was going forward, and that's the point at which he fired the shots. That's exactly what I'm getting at. A few seconds ago, you were saying that you weren't sure if Mr. Rosenbaum started to fall in because he was shot. But in your interview here, the falling is occurring before the defendant even shoots Mr. Rosenbaum. That's not what I, I, I According well, to your interview, let me cl Let me clarify. I said that I wasn't sure if he didn't catch himself because he was shot. Because you can lunge forward and then put your foot out and stop yourself from falling. So sure. it wasn't clear to me. You know, for example, if he had, if the shots had not have been fired, it's not clear to me whether he would have fallen or whether he would have caught himself. That's, that's what I meant when I said that. At any rate, your statement in this interview and what you're telling us here today in person is that Mr. Rosenbaum was already falling forward when the defendant shot him. Is that Yes, accurate? his momentum was going forward. I don't know. This term falling, I just wouldn't I'm, use that. So I'm you, not going to say that because that's not what I said. You actually have said that. I'm well, using your. I'm words. not going to say that right now because I'm clarifying. Don't comment on the words. Um, it's you're, it's correct. It was a live ask, interview. No, no. And you can ask questions, but don't comment on the witness's okay. testimony. Fair enough. Um, at any rate, whether it's the momentum falling, however you want to put it, mm -hmm. Mr. Rosenbaum was in that motion. Yes. Before the defendant shot him. Yes. Okay. We can take a break now, Your Honor. All right. Um, let's take a break, folks. Uh, please don't about the case during the break. Uh, read, watch, or listen to any account of the trial. Uh, any questions, anybody? Okay, thank you. Um, oh, I didn't even tell them that. I usually keep it a secret and then uh, they eat faster. But um, I, uh, I was going to say about 1230, I'd, but if you have somewhere, it's something you have to do or something. Okay, uh, let's aim for 1230. Hope that I can get my hair cut. <laughs>